now then, with certain episodes of films or TV shows, we can like things, we can dislike things. And while it is fun to talk about the kind of episodes and shows that we do like, I honestly think it's sometimes more interesting to talk about the shows or episodes or films that we find ourselves disliking. I feel there's often a lot more to unpack there. And like with any other person, there are things that I like and things that I don't like, but I am willing to change my mind and reassess my point of view if the if the opportunity should acquire. For example, a couple of years ago, I do remember saying that the worst, my least favourite film of all time was Athura, which I do remember seeing and then just thinking to myself, well, I just don't really think it was a very good film, but over the years I did come to change my opinion on it. And I did, I did after re-watching it once just while I was on one of the channels, I did come to think of stuff, yeah, maybe I was a bit too harsh on it. At the same time, there are going to be things that I look at them and just think, no, that doesn't work for me. For example, uh, when I got the DVDs of the Jurassic Park trilogy, I watched through the first Jurassic Park, I can see why people loved it so much. I watched through The Lost World, I, I personally, I liked it okay, I didn't think it was as good as the first one, but I was happy enough with it. And then I saw Jurassic Park 3 and then thought, well there's an hour and a half of my life, I'm not getting back. To which, th there probably was some good stuff in there, but by the end of it I had to admit, yeah, this was pretty bad. But, the one I want to talk about today is a Doctor Who serial, Warriors of the Deep. This was the first serial of the 21st season of Doctor Who, first broadcast in four parts from the 5th to the 13th of January 1984 written by Johnny Byrne. Now, first time I actually watched this through, by the end of it, I personally thought this was the worst Doctor Who serial I had seen so far. And I just thought it was pretty bad, all bad, nothing more to gain from it. But, like a lot of Doctor Who serials, this was one that I began to think over time maybe needed a second watch through. Because there are elements of it that work and elements that don't. And there are some Doctor Who serials that people absolutely love, but I watched them through first time, and I was like, I don't get why people like this. Stories like uh, The Invasion, The War Games, Doctor Who and the Silurians, Planet of the Spiders, The Case of Androzani. Those are stories that I watched through, and I didn't get why people love them so much. But after a second viewing, I began to understand with them. And this one was one that, since I recently got all the stories of the Fifth Doctor, I began to think that maybe Warriors of the Deep was worth another rewatch. Worth a rewatch to basically see if I was wrong. Was I wrong? Not entirely, but anyway, let's just unpack what's in here. Now, the Fifth Doctor, played once again by Keith Davison, he has agreed to take his companion, Tegan Jamanka, played by Janet Fielding, to, to planet Earth in the future to see how things ultimately turn out. So he, along with the other companion Vizsla Turlow, played by Mark Strickson, heads to the year 2084, to which Turlow has also agreed to stick around for a while. He doesn't want to go home straight away, he's willing to stick around with the Doctor and Tegan for a bit. Anyway, when they get to 2084, they're kind of detected over planet Earth by a satellite known as Sentinel-6, and eventually have to materialise the TARDIS aboard Sea Base 4, an underwater base that's manned by a man named Vorshak, who's the leader of the base, played by Tom Adams. Now, in this, in 2084, on the planet are two kind of opposing power blocks, and there's... the sea base itself belongs to one of the power blocks, and they're mainly kind of manning missiles and scanning the seabed, looking for your various stuff. What Vorshak doesn't know is that two members of his crew are actually double agents. His second in command, Nilsson, played by Ian McCulloch, and the chief medical officer, Dr. Solo, or Dr. Solow, played by Ingrid Pitts. Now, they have, they've got their own plan because they work for the other power block and they basically want to disable the machinery so that uh, they can't launch missiles. And they intend to do this by manipulating the temporary sync operator, Maddox, played by Martin Neal, trying to kind of get him to sabotage the equipment so that one power block won't be able to launch their weapons. So much so that they even 
they mess with his kind of mind using their technology and even manage to get him to kill one uh, another officer aboard the base named Karina, played by Nitsa Sol, Soul. And this is honestly a pretty dark story, and pretty much everyone in this story ends up dead. Sorry, spoiler alert for that one. But the kind of real antagonists of this story are revealed to be the return of the Silurians and the Sea Devils. Because this was the second time, and the last time in Classic Who, that both these alien species would appear. It turns out that three Silurians, named Ichthar, Skibus, and Tarak, or Tarpok, sorry, they are looking for their Sea Devil brethren, as well as the leader of this group of Sea Devils, named Sovex. And basically, they want to manipulate events and want to gain control of the base so that they can launch the nuclear missiles at both power blocks and essentially do what the Slitheen were trying to do in Aliens of London and World War Three. They want to basically incite a nuclear war between both power blocks and then basically rise up in the ensuing destruction and claim the planet back for themselves. Now, there is some stuff that I do think works here, but let's just start off with the stuff that doesn't, because looking back at it, it's not quite as bad as I thought it was. But there are three things here that I don't really think work. Number one is the one of the creatures that they end up bringing in, and one of the sore points that really this story has, is a creature known as the Merka, which the Silurians use to try and get to get inside the base. To which its touch is poisonous, and anyone who tries to attack it manually gets killed. And the Merka, it's pretty cheap looking. I mean, you can, while with a lot, I, while I know with a lot of Doctor Who monsters, it's clearly just people in suits, this is clearly just two people underneath a blanket with a kind of head attached on one end. And while you can overlook some of the cheapness of early Doctor Who, this one I think really kind of did it dirty. But the other thing that kind of really does this down is that people have mentioned to me is the lighting. Because with dark lighting in a lot of Doctor Who sets, you could overlook some of the cheapness. Like, if you had a fairly dark room with a creature, that could make it a lot more menacing. But because the base is so brightly lit in order to show that it's the future, the highlighting really doesn't do any favours for the Merka. I mean, I don't mind it so much with the Silurians and the Sea Devils. I mean, the Silurians do have a new design compared to the one they had in 1970, but then that was 1970, this is 1984, so the design is different, I have no problem with that, but the highlighting really does kind of highlight how bad... Uh, how bad the Merka actually looks. Because in, in low lighting, you can probably get away with how this thing moves, but just in high lighting, you can just see the people underneath the blanket kind of moving about, and it is that. The other small problem I will admit I did have with this story is the slight question of why the Sea Devils are dressed like samurai. I mean, I didn't mind the Silurian design so much. I mean, I think I would prefer it if they did add a little more kind of green, as it's mostly kind of orange, their new design. I wish they had to add a little more green, because I associate that more with reptiles, but the thing is, I had no problem when the Sea Devils showed up with how their kind of brown uh, design. I thought that was pretty cool, but then once they go inside the base, they start wearing these kind of very 1980s kind of samurai designs, with a samurai-style headdress and shoulder pads, and it's just like, why? I mean, you could argue it's battle armor, sure, but just I feel they could have found a more kind of natural way to make the battle armor look more realistic. But anyway, there I will admit there is some stuff that I had forgotten that is slightly kind of entertaining. For example, how they showed the death of a sea devil. I came in the last few parts. The Doctor and Co. work out that in order to defeat the Silurians and the Sea Devils they're taking over, they end up using a gas that's aboard the uh, sea base called hexachromite. Hexachromite gas, which they plan to leak through the ventilation systems that will essentially suffocate the Silurians and the Sea Devils. And they, when they show it with a Sea Devil who discovers them, the, 
having the sea devil kind of fall over it, its face deflate like a balloon and then have kind of green slime coming out of it, I will admit it was pretty entertaining. But I, towards the end, as I said, ev pretty much everyone ends up dying, even Vorshak. I'm not sure how he kind of managed that. To which the Doctor, because their uh, sync operator was killed off earlier in the story, the Doctor agrees to kind of take over and stop the missiles from launching. In the process, though, all the Silurians and the Sea Devils are suffocated, and, of course, every human aboard the base dies. Which does show that sometimes Doctor Who could go dark. I mean, not everything is always going to be the typical happy ending. So, overall with this story, it's not as bad as I thought it was. But to call it good, that might be stretching it. I think... I have heard people say that they think the weakest story of Peter Davis and Zero was Time Flight, which I can certainly understand. For me, though, I'd still say this comes fairly close to the bottom. It's not as bad as I thought it was, but... Yeah, for me, it's, as I said, it's not quite as bad, and I will possibly say it's not a complete F. I'd say it's more an E or possibly a D+, plus, but yeah. This was a story that I felt needed to be rewatched just to see if it was as bad as I thought it was, and no, it's not. But let me know what you think of it down below. Do you actually like this story? Let me know. Anyway, until next time, see ya.